We have visitors here today, and I am Pastor Dave Couyers of Country Bible Church, and we're going to take a little look today at Ezekiel 28 again, a review of what we did last time. We're going to look at the host of heaven, the origin of angels, two Hebrew words, Nagid or Melech the king, and Satan and evil and how all this began. How did we get in the condition that the world's at? as it, we see it today. So I'm Pastor Dave Couyers, and if you want to look up any of my uh, PowerPoints, they're there on slideshare.net forward slash D Couyers, and it's on my business cards also. So let's, re in review, let's, let me read the uh, fif 15 verses in Ezekiel 28, and follow along in your Bibles in Ezekiel 28 if you have one. And the translations will be a little different on some of them. But this is the NAU, which is usually what I present on the screen. Ezekiel 28, verse 1. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, say to the leader of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, Because your heart is lifted up and you have said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods, in the heart of the seas. Yet you are a man. We're dealing with a man in these first portions of it, and not a God. Therefore, you make your heart like the heart of God. Behold, are you, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that is a match for you. By your wisdom and understanding, you have acquired riches for yourself and have acquired gold and silver for your treasuries. By your great wisdom, by your trade, you have increased your riches, and your heart is lifted up because of your riches." Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have made your heart like the heart of God, therefore, behold, I will bring strangers upon you, the most ruthless of nations. He's talking about Babylon. And they will draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They will bring you down to the pit and you will die the death of those who are slain in the heart of the seas. Will you still say, I am a God, in the presence of your slayer, though you are a man and not God, in the hands of those who wound you? You will die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken, declares the Lord God. Verse 11, again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lament over the king of Tyre. Last time we had leader or ruler king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and beauty, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise and the emerald, and the gold, the workmanship of your settings and the sockets, was in you. On that day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were in the midst of the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until, remember I told you to always circle and underline and flash back on the untils. He was created, was perfect until unrighteousness was found in you. It wasn't created in him, it was found in him. Satan, all angels, like humans, are given a will, a, a willer, if you would, uh, the ability to choose to have a relationship with God or not have or be obedient to God. And Satan was created blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. And so that's, that's where the problem starts. We looked at this last time, but it's so profoundly important with dividing up Ezekiel 28 that I wanted to look at again with regard to the leader of Tyre. Verse 2, Son of man, say to the leader of Tyre, or prince, or ruler, or commander, lots of words you could put in here as... Uh, this, I'm going to show you that in a minute, of Tyre. And we're talking about Tyre. 
we just read about the extreme wealth of the city-state of Tyre. They had land holdings on the mainland, a beautiful coastal town that they owned and, and had. And then they also had a, a big, beautiful island about a quarter to a half mile offshore. And they were a seafaring nation. They didn't have an army. They had a very powerful navy and a navy of commerce. And they dealt with every nation on the, on the planet. And that's what their great wealth came from. And then God last time gave them as an allegory of their whole nation as being a shipwreck, how total a shipwreck is. But he goes, you are a man and not a God. So this leader of Tyre is, has been saying, I am a God. And that's a problem that started in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel with Nimrod, who, who claimed himself to be God. And every super powerful nation since then, they seem to devolve into that. Um, and all the Caesars, all the pharaohs, they all make this kind of a claim. And God says, you're not a, man. You're not a god, you're a, a man. And you're going to die, and I'm going to send the Babylonians to kill you. <laughs> and he calls them the most ruthless of nations. The Babylonians, the Assyrians were bad enough. They were the one that would string you on a brass chain and drag you behind the camels, take their captives. But the Babylonians were the most famous as the most barbarous. So this word leader of Tyre here from Strong's, it's number 5057. It's the word Nagid. You'll hear me re refer to Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah, the ruler, the prince. And uh, it can also mean king, sometimes translated in there. It can mean prince, princes, ruler, officers, officials, lots of different commander. I'm going to show you in Joshua 5.15 today that uh, it's used there, I believe. No, it's Sar there, I think. Uh, and... So verse 2 says the leader of Tyre. When we get to verse 12, we switch gears. And we're, I believe we're now talking right through the, king, the leader of Tyre into the power and the authority and the throne behind the leader of Tyre. We're speaking right to the king of Tyre. And that's the Strong's number 4428, Melech in the Hebrew. And it, I know you're a Hebrew, so if you catch me mispronouncing too badly, just interrupt, okay? <laughs> then slap my hand. It's fine. <laughs> no, it's good because I'm like, okay, I'm relating it to a Hebrew prayer. It's like, yeah. It's right. yeah. So, yeah, Melech is, uh, is uh, only translated king in very, all of its various forms, forms. Once royal, it looks like five times. So, so and I think what's happening here, because there's huge confusion and controversy about who's being addressed here, because the early 11 chapters say, you being a man. God repeats that a couple times. Clearly, he's talking to the man, the, the Nagid of Tyre, in the first 11 verses. And then we can't get to there. It's like the Lord just kind of pulls him aside and speaks right through him to the power behind him. And, and directs his, and this is often paralleled with, and I have taught it that way, with Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14 kind of does the same thing. God's addressing him, and he just kind of goes right through and addresses Satan, it seems like. And, uh, and, and two of my best teachers disagree with that, and they say 14 is not a, is specifically only addressing the man, but it's the man yet future, the coming world leader. We have a coming world leader who will be indwelt with Satan. And, and that's, they believe it's a prophecy, not uh, a history passage in Isaiah 14. So. so, various translations have uh, NAS, NAU, and the Young's Literal Translation have the leader of Tyre. The King James family has the Prince of Tyrus or Tyre. Uh, the NIV family, uh, Net Bible, uh, and the New Jerusalem Bible all have the ruler of Tyre. Tyre. And when I look it up in the, um, in the Greek, I jumped up to Ephesians 2.2. 2. There we find out that the prince, and it's archonta or archon, uh, which is ruler, lord, or prince, Speaking of Satan, he says he is the prince of the power of the air. 
of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So Ephesians 2.2 2 takes this, this satanic entity, the devil, and says that he's, he has control even of our air, the atmosphere, and the planet. Uh, and he is the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. So when you wonder, how can this whole system be so corrupted? How could a loving God allow what's going on on the planet? I mean, America is butchering a million babies a year in the womb. How can, how can God allow that? Well, it's because we're under the prince of the power of the air, the devil, and he is working in the sons of disobedience, kind of like he was working back through the leader of Tyre here also. Um, and the reason I wanted to spend a little time on the Gid is because the last four verses of Daniel chapter 9 deal with the most profound, pointed, uh, specific prophecies yet future to us. If you want to find past history, that look all the way to the new heavens and new earth, then you want to look at Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 7. But if you want to find out mostly what's happening, especially with the, the Jewish nation from uh, from the, time, the first century all the way to the new heavens and new earth, they come up in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Uh, but specifically, it starts talking about the Mashiach, Nagid, the Messiah, the Prince, uh, in Daniel 9, 25. And it identifies him that he would be cut out. He would be cut off for a capital crime. So, okay, so... We deal with over the king of Tyre. I believe that in our passage here, God is speaking right through the leader of Tyre to the power behind him, the one who controls him, the devil. And that's when you tie in Isaiah 14 uh, with the five eye wills of Satan, then you start seeing that, okay, this is what the devil's been doing from Genesis 3, then Genesis 11 with the Tower of Babel and Nimrod. And you go through the rest of the history when I did my, uh, my, I think my bachelor's degree, um, I did the crimson thread that goes all through the whole Bible uh, that follows that line. So, but I want to take a little more closely look at the creation of Satan. So, when were the angels created? The origin of angels. Uh, Daniel Weirbach posted, sometimes before day six of creation, because all the angels rejoiced at the completion of creation. And most believe it was Lucifer who was the anointed cherub walking in the garden, according to Ezekiel. But that's probably as close to an answer as scripture details from my study at least, close quote. Uh, he uses this word Lucifer. That, that word only comes, it's a KJVism. It only comes up in the 400-year-old translation of, of that. And many... All of the modern translations don't use this translation there in uh, the one place that it comes up in the Bible. But it's, so, but it's stuck. Everybody knows who Lucifer is and because of the KJV. Job 38.4.7 gives us a little more information. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So here, Job is God is telling Job that at the creation, the morning stars, that's the angels, sang together. The sons of God are uh, I won't go into who the sons of God. There's only four categories of people that are the sons of God, and angels are one of them. Uh, they're described because they're direct creations of God, not, not created by birth like we are. Ezekiel 28, 4 through 15, our passage. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Wast thou upon the holy mountain of God? Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Uh, Bible scholars are a little divided over whether this is talking about 
the Garden of Eden that Adam and Eve were in, or if there's an Eden in heaven. And, and I, ask me a different day and I'll probably give you a different answer. <laughs> but I kind of lean more and more increasingly to that it was on planet Earth in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And that there were fiery stones and all those things there in that garden that are not described anywhere else. Could also be that it was talking about heaven. And the reason, the best reason why it's talking about an Eden in heaven is because he says he's cast down right in the same passage. <coughs> so, we're going to take a little side trip. We do this once or twice a year where I find somebody that's a lot smarter and better than me and I'll grab their PowerPoint. So slides like this that we've been looking at are mine. This is uh, McCarrico Park up in north of Fort Bragg. And the black slides following are by Dr. Joe Martin. Uh, and he also contributes to slides. He's actually, I met him at a conference and he was the one that encouraged me to, uh, to start posting my slides on SlideShare. And, and I finally maxed out my account at 300, so. So this is his PowerPoint on the origin of angels by Dr. Joe Martin, Biblical Discipleship Ministries. Uh, and it's a good website. And I may have pulled this off of his website. He's got a lot of free resources there also. Genesis 1, 31 through 2, 1. Okay, this is the creation story. Chapter 2 is where we get more information about the creation story. We get an elaboration on exactly how Adam was created, how Eve was created from him, and so on. Uh, but verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Okay. God just told us, in the Ezekiel passage, on the day you were created, speaking of Satan, remember? So we know Satan is a created being. All the angels are created beings. So when God says he saw everything that he had made or created, and he adds the very in here. Most of the references in the other 30 verses in Genesis 1 have good, and it was very good, or it was good. He saw that it was this, and it was good. But when he finishes out here, he says everything that he made was very good. So from that, we know that Satan hadn't fallen already. But verse 2, thus when the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. So when were the, this is another term for angels. I'm going to show you that. He's going to show you that. So when it says, and all of the angels of them, or all of the messengers of them, would be a better way to put it, were created and finished on day one. I mean, uh, by day six. All of the hosts of the heavens and earth. Excuse me. So he's going to take a little look at all the hosts. Would all the hosts include the angels? Rhetorical question. Of course it would. Hebrew word for host is sava. Uh, and it, it's translated usually in most of our modern English Bibles as army. Sava is the word that's common for army. So you could say all the armies of heaven, I believe, and you wouldn't be that unbiblical, unhebraic. Um, for those interested in the Strong's Concordance 6635, if you want to look it up. I should have posted it in for you. But host refers to all things alive and inanimate. It comes up again in Joshua 5, 3, 13 through 15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man, make note of that, it's a man, over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him. And he said to him, Art thou for us or art thou for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as... Sar, or captain of the host of the Lord, I am now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from thy foot, for the place where thou standeth is holy. And Joshua did so. 
So get the picture. They're about to go into battle. They're worried. Joshua goes out on a night patrol and he encounters in the dark somebody with a drawn sword, a man with a drawn sword. And he confronts him. You force her against us. And this is what <laughs> the captain of the Lord's host tells him. Take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. In other words, where I'm standing is holy ground. That's what he's saying. And so consequently, Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship him. So we know it wasn't an angel. Okay. This remove your sandals is a quote right out of the Old Testament. I repeat it again. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down. And I, and I say about half of the English translations say and worship. So I don't know what your translation, most of you are using NASB or the NAU, I mean, and it doesn't have it in there. But almost all of the rest of the translations, especially all of the King James family, they all have a bow down and worship. And I didn't dig into the textual criticism enough to be able to tell you if that's one of the words that slipped in or was that was added. They don't know. They're working on it. But uh, anyway, half of the translations add, and worshiped him and said to him, and, it, and it's... When Joshua falls down in reverence like this, it's, I think it's safe to assume that he would have understood that in worship. He said to him, what has my Lord to say to his servant? Captain of the Lord host said to Joshua, remove your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So does that sound a little familiar to you? It's the second time that that exact phrase has come up. I'm going to show it to you. Remember the account of the burning bush, Exodus 3, 2? When the angel, again, don't, when you see that word angel in the Bible, don't assume we're talking about the little cherubs that you see in the gift store. Uh, you know, I've told you before with cherubim, you want to think of uh, the A1, A-10 warthog, you know, aircraft, or of Abram's tank because they're military messengers from the Lord. But this word in Hebrew and Greek both mean messenger. So if a colonel sent a sergeant to deliver a message to a captain, he's an angelos. He's, he's a, an angel. He's a messenger of that person. So anybody that delivers a message like that from someone else is angelos in the Greek. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in blazing fire from the midst of the bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight. Why the bush is not burned up? When the Lord saw, okay, do you see what we just did there? We went from the angel of Jehovah, Yahweh, you say Hashem? I don't know When you... Adonai, you know, insert Adonai. When the angel of Adonai, it's the unspeakable name that we've talked about so many times in the past. And I usually will say one of the ways that we pronounce it. But, uh, when the, uh, but here, do you see, we've got the angel of the Lord speaking to him. And then when the Lord saw, and it's Jehovah again, that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush. So either we've got the angel of the Lord leaving the bush, and somehow God appearing, and there's no mention of it here, or the angel of the Lord is in the place of Yahweh, Jehovah, Hashem, Adonai. So God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, and he goes on, and it's Jehovah, Yahweh, Hashem, Adonai again. So we've got this strange mix in both places of this angelic being who's described as a man, a messenger man, who comes to planet Earth and demands this kind of reverence from Joshua. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing. 1 Kings 22, 19, Mark, Job Martin goes on again. And he said, Hear thou, therefore, the word of 
Adonai again, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. Daniel chapter 8, verse 10. And it, speaking of the little horn of Daniel, the coming world leader, the Antichrist, we call him generally, waxed great even to the host of heaven. And, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped on them. So this is a reference to the fall of Satan when God cast him out of heaven and he took a third of the angels with him. To the host or against the host is this reference he's put in here. So here you have this coming world leader speaking directly to the angelic host of heaven. Psalm 148, verses 2 and 3. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. So here I believe we've got three different uh, or two different references to hosts, and then we get into the celestial beings. We have seen hosts can refer to angelic beings, but hosts can also refer to inanimate stellar bodies like the sun, moon, and stars. Deuteronomy 4.19, A, picks up on it. And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou says, seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the hosts of heaven shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them. So here is clearly God's warning about worshiping the sun, moon, and stars. <coughs> and it was very, very common in most of the cultures they have would revere the created sun, moon, and stars. Second Kings 23, verse 5. And he put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense, incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem. Them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to all the host of heaven. So here, would this include angelic beings or is it just the sun, moon, and stars? I think the and there would probably connect it together that he's talking about they were worshiping the sun, moon, and stars and the angels would be my first guess. But Isaiah 34, 4. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine and as a falling fig from the fig tree. So here... He's talking about dissolving the heavens. This is what comes up in 2 Peter 3.10 when we're told that even the very elements of planet Earth are going to burn up with fervent heat. And I, and I, if you go into Colossians chapter 1, there's a problem that physics have with the greater and lesser nuclear forces. You know, why isn't the planet blow up? What's containing this nuclear activity in there? And if you get to Colossians 1, you find out there who it is. It's Jesus Christ. He's the one that holds all things together according to the Bible. So I see him as the greater nuclear force and probably the lesser nuclear force. And that when this happens, I see that as him releasing the elements. And the very elements are going to be transformed and burned up with fervent heat. Matthew 24, 29 says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. This, the, tribula the tribulation with the definite article in it in front of it, Jesus referred to it as the great tribulation. So we use that phrase, the great tribulation. Old Testament, it's referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a very specific time of sifting of Jacob that will be, uh, Jesus says, a time like it that there's never been before or ever will be again afterwards. And if those days had not been shortened, there'd be no flesh saved. And that's yet future to us. Jeremiah 13, verse 8, tells that the Jews, uh, two-thirds of them will perish in the yet coming holocaust that's, that's hanging out there in time. So Genesis 2, 1 again, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. Exodus 20, 11, 
For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them is, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So what he is tying this together here from Exodus to here is that the in the six days, you know, prior before Genesis 2.1, there had to have been all of the angels were created in a very good condition, including Satan and the fallen angels. So after 2-1, somewhere there, but by the time we get to chapter 3, we find Satan has already fallen. So somewhere in there is where evil crept into the world. Since the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and everything in them within his six-day work week, which days were the same kind of days that people work, See Exodus 20, verse 9. The angels must also have been created within that creation week and not sometime before the first day of the week, which is brought up by a lot of people. Or they'll bring them up in a a gap theory between verse 1 and verse 2 of chapter 1 of Genesis. Everything that the Lord Jesus says was created within that original six-day week. Uh, and it's in our New Testament that we get the idea that Jesus is the creator. It comes up in John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, and in Colossians chapter 1, verses uh, 15 and 16, tells us that Jesus was the one that the Lord used to create. Nothing, nothing but God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit existed before the first day of the six-day creation week. And now from modern science, we understand that there was not even a space. There was no space, time, matter, energy, nothing. It was uh, only, only God before day one of creation week. And now we know that the, the universe had a beginning. It all came into existence at one flash and point in time over a six day period. And, and that, that, Creation is evident now many ways in science that we see that uh, the universe is not only expanding, but it's accelerating as it sp- expands. So it's, it's, going, it's going faster today than it was yesterday, which affects our time. Lots of things affect our time. But anyway, Job 1.6. Now there was a day when the sons of God, again, title for angelic beings, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And that's a Hebrew word meaning the adversary, Satan. So sons of God equals angels. I can show you that. It takes a little more longer. But in Job 38, verse 7, says in verse 4, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, and if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Therefore, uh, whereupon are the foundations therefore fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And he's saying the morning stars would be Mercury and Venus. Those are those two lowest, brightest stars that we get to see several times a year. Excuse me. Um, so God's challenging here, Job here at this. He's, he hits him with 70-something questions, pounding away on Job. Where were you when I created the world? And that's kind of what's going on here. But from this, we know that the morning stars, the two planets sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So the angelic beings were created there by the time that we, uh, the foundations were laid or fastened. An interesting study is how what ancient cultures all through history have come up with to try to say what is Earth sitting on. The backs of turtles, it's on, well, what's that turtle on? Well, it's on the back of another turtle. Well, what's that turtle on? Well, it's turtles all the way down, one atheist said. <laughs> uh, or the, the Greeks and, had Atlas with this globe sitting on the back of his deal and, and on and on. It's a, a joke what they've tried to come up with. The Bible's accurate. It says that in Job that he hangeth the the world on nothing. You know, centrifugal force, in other words. The angels seem to be observing God as he creates. Could they have been created on the first day of the creation week? 
if they were watching it, it must have been midweek at least. Okay? Some people think that the angels were created on day four of the creation week as part of the heavenly host. Uh, this heavenly host is referring to sun, moon, and stars that were created on day four. Angels must have been created within, and that's verse 14 of chapter 1 if you want to look it up. Angels must have been created within the original six-day creation work since the creator, Lord Jesus, made everything that he made within that six-day week. Another reason that the angels must have been created within the original six-day week is that everything was very good at that point. This would mean no sin, disease, death, decay, thorns, fossil beds, rebellion, etc. Okay? This is what we look forward to in the new heavens and new earth. After the book of Revelation chapter 20, we find out that there is no more almost like a list like that. Death, disease, disaster, destruction is the way I summarize it. Even dandruff. Lucifer must have fallen shortly after the first day and Adam and Eve very soon after that, according to Romans 5, verse 12. First and that's... Hmm? The first week. Oh, thank you. Uh, you said first day. Oh, yeah. No, thank you for the correction. Very important. Uh, yeah, after the first week, uh, and we know that it was still good on 2-1, and, but by the time we get to chapter 3, we find that the, he's already fallen. A perfect man and woman with the command of God to fill the earth could start having babies at the end of the first nine months. That's presuming. Scholars are divided over there, I might add, but it's highly likely that Eve would have conceived shortly after uh, the nine months. And so it's reasonable, since there's no mention of Cain or Abel uh, anywhere up until we get to chapter four, that Somewhere before there. Eve may have been pregnant even when, <laughs> when uh, this, the devil uh, tricked her, deceived her. So in his conclusion, angels are created beings, number one. God made everything that he created within the original six-day creation week. Therefore, angels were created within the original six-day creation week. Another in conclusion, he's got about six of these, is that is it likely that Lucifer fell shortly after the original seven-day week? Perhaps Lucifer became Satan on the first day of the second week. Perhaps during the second week, Satan, through the super serpent, tempted Eve, and she and Adam sinned, and the whole universe was cursed by our holy God. Or I wouldn't have put it that way. I would have said the whole world was separated in relationship from God that the cursed thing is an issue. It's, you know, are we currently under a punishment from, because of Adam's sin, or are we suffering the consequences of Adam's sin? I'm in the camp. I say it's not a punishment. We are under the consequences of all humanity. 100% of humanity chose to disobey God and listen to Satan and follow him. And the consequences of that is everyone who's been born as a human since then uh, falls into that same human category of separated from God. So God dealt with the serpent first in Genesis 3.14, which is an interesting thing. The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. Some guys make a big deal about that humans are referred to as nothing but dust. And uh, so, but I think it's more the fact that God somehow limited the serpent to crawling on his belly at this point in time. And I think this is why there's, most of humans have a, have a fear and a, a hatred almost of serpents. <laughs> I know my wife does. <laughs> I try to go easy on the king snakes because they eat rattlesnakes and they're the ones I'm really worried about, but... It hit home for us last, last summer. We killed four rattlesnakes right in our front yard, right close in our front yard. Luckily, my new dog went on full alert and acted funny and caused me to uh, go out and dispatch him. That's a rabbit trap.
He goes on, in conclusion, after dealing with the serpent, but before proclaiming the curse upon Adam and Eve, God promises redemption for the now unholy and unrighteous race of Adam. Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it will bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So this is the battle that's been going on for... uh, 4,000 years now, Uh, almost 6,000 years. Another in conclusion he adds, that redemptive work was to come in the person of the Messiah, God's only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would come to earth and dwell among his people as a man. He would lead a sinless life and die on the cross of Calvary to take the penalty and punishment for the sins of his creation, the race of Adam. He even paid the penalty that God can redeem the planet and the animal kingdom came about because of that. So, and I thought I had another slide in here. I didn't. So I just added some on the end. So we're doing pretty well today. That's a good thing. So in closing, did you know scientists finally concluded that the chicken came before the egg because the protein which makes eggshells is only produced by hens? (laughs) You see a problem there? (laughs) So, okay, how'd you get the chicken is the question that you should be asking if you didn't get it from an egg. So, and what does God say? He says he created all of the animals in a mature state. So So I say, yeah, and chickens are only produced by eggs. Also, chickens are protein with DNA digital code written on each, each cell. Yet you can't get protein without DNA. So which came first, the digital DNA code or the protein? If I hold up this piece of paper and a pencil, you know, it's not going to do anything until there's a message, a coded message. I'll write it in code. I can clumsily try to write it in Hebrew. I can maybe do a little bit better writing it in Greek. But I'm primarily right in English, and I've given up on Spanish. But all four of those are coded digital information like that. These letters that you're reading here, okay, that letter there, or the O, or the D, those are digital letters. And if you go to Afghanistan, and you show them that word there, they won't get it. Because they're not privy to the digital code. These things are in always 100% of the time created by an intelligent being. When I say digital, I'm talking about not analog. We're talk- and the illustration I like to use, you guys have heard it before, is the best illustration of a, di- a digital code that I can come up with is the midnight ride of Paul Revere. One if by land, two if by sea. That's a digital code. There's three parts required to it. There has to be a sender, there has to be a receiver, and there has to be an agreement on the protocol. So I can put these verses up here, and you can read that because we are in agreement about the digital code that I'm using. If Arlene puts up Hebrew up there, you're not going to be able to follow along with it because you're not privy to the protocol. It, even if I put Greek up there, you're going to go, what, what? and I try, I'll walk you through it sometimes, right? <laughs> But, but it's a different protocol. So digital codes only come about from intelligent beings, a sender, a receiver, and an agreed-upon protocol. That's only found as coming from minds. You don't get that from the zoo to the goo to you. It doesn't come that way. And you have to have the protein to write the DNA on And you can't write the DNA on anything until you get the protein, which is made up by the DNA. So this chicken and the egg thing is elementary school compared to what's going on at the DNA levels. Mm -hmm. And the DNA there, all of your 30 trillion cells in your body, every one of them has got got a string of DNA in there, about six feet long in every cell. It is so compressed. This DNA language is so compressed And it's coded language, just like this English language that I'm showing you, or the Hebrew we showed you. It is so compressed. You say, well, how compressed is it? 
Let me try to give you an illustration. If you could take a pinhead, imagine a pinhead of DNA. That DNA has letter, sentence, paragraphs, and words like, like I'm showing you on the screen. You say, well, how many? Well, it's a stack of books in a pinhead of DNA. You say, well, that's kind of vague. How, how tall of a stack of books? Well, a stack of books would reach to the moon. You say, well, how big is a stack of books? It's like one stack of books to the moon would be pretty spindly. How big is a stack of books? 500 books from here to the moon in a pinhead of DNA. That's how much compressed information is in your cells. It's just mind boggling. And it's all digital, not analog. It's so much evidence. Every cell in your body is an absolute proof that God is sovereign. And he wrote the code. He wrote, he wrote the DNA and put it on protein, if you would. If she belonged to you, what would you we raise grass-fed beef, you guys know. <laughs> if, she, if she belonged to the name, what would you name her? <laughs> Um, what's the Hebrew word for seven? That's um, hmm? uh, seven is um, oh man, it's right there, and it's a, it's one of my memorized one of the ones that I know all the time. So we told the new pastor that he could that that we are a church with a desire to grow. She says, yeah, as long as it doesn't mean change or new people or someone sitting in our pew or a different kind of music. <laughs> Isn't that the way it usually goes. I bring that up because we got new pews coming. We got new visitors today. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> so, and then I shot this photo of this grizzly bear in Alaska when we were up there. Therefore, the Lord longs to be gracious to you, and therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are those who long for him, Isaiah 30, verse 18. That is one of the scariest phrases that's ever been uttered. God is a God of justice. And that should send chills up your back. If you understand how much you've rebelled against him, how much sin we've, we've all committed, uh, I praise God that I won't stand before him and get the justice that I deserve, but that my sin debt went to Jesus Christ and God judged my sin debt on the cross by Jesus Christ. So we finally got a confirmed picture of that. So, And I'm going to close with a word of prayer as soon as I can figure out again how to escape this and quit this. Quit keynote. That's not the one I want. I want this one to quit. Quit. Come on. Quit one of you. Every time I do this differently, don't I, Ellen?